Manny Man Does History. After World War II, relations between the former Allies, the United States of America, and the Soviet Union broke down and brought about an era known as the Cold War, where the world was divided by politics and ideology into East and West. The end of World War II had brought about a new age of warfare in the form of the atomic bomb. The 1950s saw a massive amount of nuclear testing between the USA and the Soviet Union constantly demonstrating how powerful they were. One incident which could have ended it all for everyone was the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. After the Cuban Revolution, led by Fidel Castro in 1959, Cuba, who had been an ally of the US, began to make links with the Soviet Union. America attempted to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs by training Cuban exiles in 1960, but it was a disaster and they suffered a defeat. The Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev had the idea to place nuclear missiles in Cuba to deter any future invasion similar to the Jupiter missiles the United States had placed in Italy and Turkey in case of a Soviet invasion. He also wanted the NATO-controlled West Berlin, which he planned to bargain for. The missiles were secretly shipped to Cuba and construction began to make them operational. On October 14th, an American U-2 aircraft noticed the missiles in Cuba and the CIA informed the president the next morning in Washington, D.C. The medium-range ballistic missiles had the ability to launch as far as DC. The long-range ballistic missiles could reach almost all of the contiguous United States. President John F. Kennedy was faced with many choices. The Joint Chiefs of State believed that full-scale attack and invasion of Cuba was the only option, but in doing this, the Soviets could retaliate, ultimately leading to total nuclear war. Kennedy wanted to avoid appearing like a bunch of trigger-happy cowboys in the eyes of their allies. Technically, these new nuclear missiles didn't change much, as they added 40 nukes to the Soviet arsenal of 300, compared to the United States' 5,000 strategic nukes. But the Americans couldn't be seen to be doing nothing. On October 18th, Kennedy met the Soviet Minister of Foreign Affairs, who assured him that any weapons on Cuba were defensive. Kennedy didn't want him to know that he already knew about the nukes. They decided to blockade Cuba, calling it a quarantine, because technically a blockade was an act of war. It kept the US in control, and wasn't the most aggressive of things to do. Any Soviet ships found to be carrying weapons to Cuba would be turned back. Kennedy informed his allies what was going on before addressing the nation. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The United States moved to DEFCON 3. The world stirred uncomfortably, wondering how bad the threat was. The Pope appealed to both Khrushchev and Kennedy, asking for peace. Khrushchev publicly compared the quarantine to piracy and warned Kennedy that this was an act of aggression. The photos of the missiles were shown to the United Nations Security Council in front of the Soviet ambassador, who refused to confirm their existence. The USA moved to DEFCON 2 and prepared for all-out war. Some Soviet ships challenged the blockade, but most of the ships, presumably carrying weapons, turned around. An American invasion of Cuba was still on the cards, but they decided to hold out for diplomacy. Neither side were backing down. The situation was at a stalemate. Word reached Kennedy via a Soviet spy offering a possible diplomatic solution. The Soviets would remove the missiles under UN supervision if the US promised not to invade Cuba. A letter then appeared for Kennedy, appearing to have been written personally by Khrushchev, offering that the two of them stop tightening the knot of war and dooming the world. 
its authenticity was questionable, and they studied it further. Feeling an invasion of Cuba was imminent, Fidel Castro suggested to Khrushchev that the Soviets should attack first before the US do. On October 27th, Khrushchev made a public broadcast offering a new deal to Kennedy that he remove the Jupiter missiles from Turkey. It contradicted the previous offer, indicating there may have been a coup in power. The Jupiter missiles were obsolete and the US planned to remove them anyway. Also, Turkey didn't like being used as a bargaining chip. An American U-2 plane, which was checking the progress of the missiles, was shot down over Cuba. Despite this, neither side chose to escalate the crisis further. The US decided to ignore Khrushchev's second offer and take him up on the first offer, with the added secret guarantee that the Jupiter missiles in Turkey would be removed a few months later voluntarily. As they waited for the response, they continued to prepare for war and urged their allies to do the same. A US Navy ship dropped warning depth charges at a Soviet submarine on the blockade line. The sub was armed with nuclear torpedoes, but thankfully they chose not to fire them. A US plane was also chased out of Kamchatka by MiGs on an unauthorized mission. By that evening, the Soviets and the Americans had come to an agreement. They would remove missiles from Cuba, Italy and Turkey, respectively. The United States also pledged to leave Cuba alone. Once the weapons were dismantled and on their way home, the US dropped their blockade. Khrushchev initially left 100 nuclear missiles not specified in the US demands in Cuba. But in case Castro did something rash, Khrushchev had them shipped away too. Months after the crisis, the Jupiter missiles were dismantled also, unknownst to the public that this was because of the crisis in Cuba. Despite avoiding total thermonuclear war, the Soviet Union appeared weakened by these events, and Khrushchev ultimately lost power two years later. Castro felt betrayed by the Soviets, although Cuba remained safe, although the less said about Guantanamo Bay, the better. John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, just over a year after the crisis. This crisis was a pure breakdown in communication. The Moscow-Washington hotline was set up from then on to allow the leaders to communicate directly rather than second-guessing each other. The Cold War would continue for decades, and the United States would go on to suffer one of its worst defeats in Southeast Asia. But that's a story for another time. Ba-bum!